Hello family and welcome to our boring meditation stuff. Uh, the conversation about meditation and crippling anxiety that we're all feeling right now. Um, today I wanted to expand on an idea that I introduced in the last couple of videos. Um, this idea is that there is a spectrum on which behavior lies and that um, that behavior can be seen as uh, unenlightened or enlightened. It can be seen as good or evil. And um, we often see this uh, emerge in, um, in religious contexts and in popular culture. Um, in the media, we, we tend to see it everywhere, um, that this dichotomy is created and it's generally a false dichotomy, but um, at its heart, I think that it's maybe not a false dichotomy in the way that we usually think of it. So we usually think, oh, there's a false dichotomy between uh, the British and the Germans um, in the case of let's say World War II. Um, there's a false dichotomy between the Chinese and the Japanese um, with respect to uh, their violent engagements. Um, and as things get further away from us, so as a Canadian, um, it's arguably easier for me to see that there's a false dichotomy between the Chinese and the Japanese, that there isn't one evil culture or one evil country and one good culture and one good country um, and that they're fighting out this kind of righteous battle. Um, the story is always much more complicated than that. And that sort of false dichotomy we see and we understand. Um, at least most of us do. We, <laughs> we, tend, to, we tend to appreciate that um, none of our enemies on a global scale are really our enemies, they're just other people. But it's still tempting to subscribe to the idea of um, either a good evil spectrum uh, or there's always this temptation to just throw the whole thing out, right? Um, that, oh, it's all nature, it, it's all part of the universe, how could any of it really be evil in some fundamental way? Um, there, is no, there is no such thing as evil, um, but to think it into being. Um, and philosophically, that idea has some merit, but it's, it's not entirely correct. Um, and part of the problem is that we think of the spectrum as kind of a a left-right spectrum. Um, and it's not really, it's not something that we can observe um, in the third person. We can't say, oh, I'm outside of that and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to observe the good people and the bad people, the good actions and the bad actions. Um, and I think that the perfect uh, illustration is actually the book and then TV series, Good Omens, um, because it sort of really plays up this uh, false dichotomy in a sort of classic um, Abrahamic or Judeo-Christian context where the good, the good creatures are the angels, maybe, um, and the bad creatures are the demons, and um, the good is always above and the bad is always below. Um, and it causes these kind of cute introspections on the parts of the angel and the demon who are the main characters. Um, so the, uh, the demon, if he, if he does something nice, if he does something kind, he's sort of self-questioning, like, oh, this is, this is the, the wrong thing for me to be doing because the right thing for me to be doing is the set of evil behaviors associated with demons. Um, and the inherent paradox there tells us actually a surprising amount about 
the true nature of good and evil, that really good and evil isn't some third person spectrum that we can observe from outside. We can't watch good omens and say, oh, okay, yeah, these characters are good and these characters are bad. And that's part of the, um, the kind of goofy little message in that book um, and TV show. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't serve us to eliminate this idea entirely. Um, this is essentially a form of nihilism, right? To say, oh, okay, yeah, sort of there's a spectrum, but the spectrum's all imaginary and actually it's all the same. It's all God's work or it's all just a function of a mechanical and uncaring universe that um, that doesn't have any opinions about which of these things are right and which of these things are wrong. Um, you know, murder, slander, rape, all that stuff is the same as um, feeding someone, clothing someone, giving them a place to sleep. Obviously it's not. We sort of understand this intuitively, but to my knowledge, it is only uh, a set of information that is available through meditation, which is kind of an, like, this is an interesting sort of concrete thing I can say about meditation that prior to deep meditation, I didn't, I had only abstract concepts, right, um, to work with. So I sort of knew, like, if I saw a dog on the street and it was behaving in a way I didn't like, I would feel annoyed with the dog, but I certainly wouldn't kick the dog. Um, that's wrong. It's wrong to do. It's wrong to do whether it's against the law. It's wrong to do whether other people would judge me for it. It's simply a wrong behavior. And I knew that intellectually. Um, but you don't entirely appreciate where that impulse or lack thereof is coming from. So the sort of person who would kick the dog, why? Why would they kick the dog? Why would they choose to do that? Are they choosing to do it? Um, and you start to realize that there are uh, a series of compulsions that are happening all the time. Like one compulsion is leading to another compulsion and you have a feeling inside, um, physical sensation, like a very, not an abstract feeling, right? A very real concrete thing that you're feeling. And you're feeling this all the time. Uh, we are all feeling it all the time and we just actually have no idea that it's there. So we get angry, we get annoyed and what's happening internally is actually um, quite a lot of discomfort. Um, and this is uh, a sort of fundamental truth that you can lean on and you can only really lean on it for yourself. I can't look at anyone else and say, oh, I know you're boiling inside because you're so angry. Um, I, I know that you feel miserable inside physically because you're crying and you're sad. I don't know that. I don't know what anyone else is feeling physically at any time. It's impossible for me to know. But I can know this about myself and only about myself. And so this is kind of uh, an interesting way to take the spectrum, which we were previously sort of, I think everybody sort of has this idea that you can examine it in the third person. You can look from the outside and say, oh, okay, this thing is right and this thing is wrong and I see where along the spectrum you lie. Um, you are 12 points out of 20 evil or something like that. Um, and it, it doesn't help at all to uh, to expand the spectrum into a plane or uh, a 3D um, sort of cartography or anything like that. The number of dimensions you have to this doesn't help at all. Um, so you can't come up with some sort of like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, two, you, oh, you have two axes, like your <laughs> lawful good or chaotic evil or something. It, it doesn't matter because you will never know. You can't know what another person is feeling about their own actions. Um, and so what you have to do is, uh, whether you have like one 
uh, axis or whether you have multiple axes, doesn't really matter. But let's, let's stick with one for simplicity. You take it and you just rotate it 90 degrees, right? And so now, I'm gonna see my other hand. <laughs> now this axis is facing away from me um, or toward me. And it becomes a sort of tunnel. I'm looking down into this tunnel and at any given point in time, I'm somewhere within the tunnel. Um, I might be toward the end of the tunnel, I might be toward the beginning of the tunnel, um, but the tunnel is, um, it, it's pretty singular, it's pretty one-dimensional really. You don't need a lot of extra complexity to think about it. Um, and you'll find that the actions and the feelings and the things that you say, um, which you intellectually know are, so to speak, wrong, right? Um, unhealthy. They will take you backward in the tunnel. And so you find you're walking backwards or you turn around and go the other way. Um, and if you are taking actions which help other people, so you're, um, you know, you're giving a donation to a charity, you're providing your time, uh, you're providing your time to an individual, you're listening, um, you're cooking someone a meal. These basic simple things that get us through life, right? Um, they, they add up and in any given moment where we're doing any of these things, um, with the right intention, <laughs> um, if I'm cooking a meal for someone and while I'm cooking it, I'm thinking, I hope he chokes on it and dies. Um, Maybe the intention's not there and it's not really a loving gesture. Um, it's these gestures of love and, um, as I said before, in particular, uh, selfless love. So we don't want the person to say, oh, this was a delicious meal. We just want them to be nourished and to be, uh, hopefully they're happy for their own sake with what we've cooked. Um, these sorts of actions take us down the tunnel um, to by tiny increments, right? Like we don't know that we're really moving down the tunnel. And the thing is, is that we're kind of, um, I say tunnel, right? The, the classic imagery is always of a path. Uh, it's always called the path or the way. Um, and you're trying to go forward down this way, down this path. But the thing is, is that you're not really, you're certainly not static on the path ever. You're always um, in this constant state of flux, your emotions, your behaviors, the way you're responding to the environment. And so you're moving and you're always kind of like jostling yourself up and down this path, running back and forth <laughs> with um, these good angelic actions and evil demonic actions that take us in these two directions. Um, and it, it's, it's a bit harsh to say that um, we're engaging in really unwholesome demonic behavior on a regular basis. We're probably not, right? But we're probably backsliding on occasion. We say something rude or um, we show our impatience. Um, we may even get angry at someone. Uh, we might allow ourselves to become overwhelmed with sadness. Um, these, or anxiety, as is the case in these video things, um, that, that's actually kind of moving us back down the path. And um, there's, there's this sort of strange recursive relationship when it comes to meditation, which is that um, the tool of meditation allows us to, uh, allows us to get a glimpse of what's going on around us. So we're on the path, but we're also in the dark <laughs> and there's no bright moon shining. And so we're kind of on the path, but we don't really know where on the path we are. We don't know where in the tunnel we are. Maybe the tunnel is a better image um, if we think about it being really dark. And so, you know, we turn on a torch um, or we light a torch in the old fashioned 
image. Um, and it provides a certain amount of brightness. So now we know at least where we stand. So if I say something to someone, does it burn literally um, in terms of sensation? Because then maybe I'm saying the wrong things. Um, and they may not seem like the wrong things on the surface. It's not always obvious that we're taking the right actions or the wrong actions. And often we're in a sort of state of confusion about whether our actions are valuable or not. Um, and if we're confused, that's actually also sending us backward down the tunnel. Um, so you, you end up in this state, uh, or maybe we start out in this state by default of kind of being blind and not really knowing which direction we're headed up or down this tunnel. And at any given time, we might be given some gross clues um, if we make someone cry or we make someone feel bad, uh, or if we know that we've made someone feel really good, um, clearly we're headed in one direction or the other. Um, but meditation gives us this light, first of all, so we can see, oh, okay, now I sort of understand more clearly. And with the breath, it's a little smaller, it's a little simpler, it's a little harder to see in some ways. Um, to what extent is the breath changing? And how is it changing? Uh, if we end up with this kind of sharp, often deep, erratic breath, um, usually we're upset. And um, if we can't even focus our attention on the breath at all, then it's also possible that we're upset or we're highly distracted, highly confused. Um, and so these are indicators, right? These are clear indicators um, of the most immediate state. They're not telling us much about the path, really. They're just telling us about like, oh, okay, maybe which direction are we headed in at least, even if we can't see much of, uh, of the tunnel or of the path. Um, and then once we move from the breath to bodily sensation, then we get a much clearer idea of what's going on in this sort of um, physical mind construct that is this like big bag of meat that we carry around with us all day. Um, are we feeling uh, particularly bad at the moment, particularly anxious, and in what way? Um, and so we know when we're anxious, we know when we feel bad, we know when we feel depressed. Um, these kind of gross, reified emotions on the surface. We know about them, but we don't know much about their components. So if you were to say uh, prior to any deep meditation, oh, okay, I feel anxious. Like I'm feeling anxious. Oh, okay. And what's under that? Like how many components to your anxiety are there? And this doesn't mean the apparent objects of anxiety. So like, oh, I'm anxious about my job. Oh, I'm anxious about my family. Oh, I'm anxious about coronavirus. Oh, I'm anxious about not being able to sleep. And that's making me not being able to sleep. And I'm anxious about this recursive behavior. No, that's not the question. Um, the question is not about objects, outside objects. The question is about um, aggregates, right? Components. So these, uh, these structures are only obvious to us at the highest level. So we, we're kind of aware of anxiety by the time it sort of reaches our mind as one thing. And if what we're seeing is one thing, um, it's too late. Like we're already running down the path, right? Um, and so you need to be able to see these thought patterns um, in smaller pieces. And you can't really do that by examining the thought patterns themselves. So you can't take apart anxiety and say like, oh, okay, like what are the two halves of my anxiety? Um, let me think really hard about it or let me investigate how I'm feeling. You won't be able to do it. You're only going to be able to see there's a big clumpy anxiety on the surface. And if you focus on that, it's likely only to make it, going to make it worse. Um, so if you have an alternative object, like the breath, you're given a way to start 
as slowly as it may be, walking down the path in the right direction. Um, or at least standing still, right? At least if I'm, if I'm bringing my attention back to the rest, bringing my attention back to the rest, I'm trying to slow my progress in the wrong direction, in the evil direction, um, and push myself toward uh, the set of thought patterns and behaviors um, which I would, uh, I would think of as being kind of beneficial, enlightened, healthy, um, good. <laughs> um, so this is generally the idea. The, the toolkit is, again, it's incredibly boring. It's incredibly simple. Um, there's not a whole lot to say about it. So uh, we end up talking about these kind of peripheral things, um, reified anxiety, reified anger. Um, and what are the consequences of my reified anger? How much anger do I have to have inside before I kick the dog? Um, this is a, I mean, this is not a very useful hypothetical question. Um, but what you'll find is that um, you have all these sorts of potentialities inside yourself, right? Um, it's entirely possible for you to commit an action you will deeply, deeply regret in the future, um, which you know to be wrong, um, simply because it's boiled inside, boiled inside until it comes up as this reified thing and it's too late. Um, it's kind of got control of you. Um, and so Anapan, Anapana, I was criticized the other day for pronouncing it the uh, pseudo-Hindi way. <laughs> um, it gives you this sort of immediate light. That's one half. That's the first half. So it gives you a sense of like, oh, okay, my breath is long or it's short it's heavy or it's light, it has these characteristics. And as it changes, I can tell, oh, okay, like I'm feeling anxious right now and my breath is going um, And it gives you uh, an indicator that says, oh, okay, like here's another indicator of anxiety, but you don't have to focus on the anxiety, you can focus on the indicator instead. Um, but what's interesting about that is that because it's pulling us away from the anxiety itself from the objects of anxiety. Uh, so if we're feeling anxious about the virus, if we're feeling anxious about our job, um, that if we choose another object of our attention, and in particular, one that still gives us information about that state, uh, that we're actually not making that state any worse. And that's hugely beneficial. So that's actually to start walking, however slowly, um, forward down the path, um, down the tunnel. <laughs> Who knows what's at the other end? Um, so that is today's uh, little topic on good omens and the, uh, the perceived left-right good-bad spectrum. Um, I hope that it was a little bit helpful in some way. Um, I hope that you are able to do uh, five, ten minutes of anapan, anapana twice a day. Um, and I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and your families because that's moving, that's moving forward down the tunnel. That's a, that's a positive way to behave. <laughs> um, everyone take care of themselves and I will see you all back here tomorrow. Goodbye.